Okay, today let's talk about citizenship. Last time we talked about democracy as a general theory, but one of the things that comes up with democracy, and that certainly came up in our discussions about it in class, is the issue of how to support and sustain democracy. This comes up in a number of ways. One of the things we talked about was um, the issue of whether or not every country, every society, is one in which democracy can or should be uh, promoted. You know, for instance, in a society where people generally don't support democracy or don't believe in it. Or in a society, uh, one thing that of course came up in spades in our discussion about it, um, in a society where uh, there's a tremendous amount of influence of money on the process, can a proper democracy be supported and sustained? And there is a whole tradition of thought, often referred to as republicanism, small r, or sometimes a civic republicanism, that tries to take these issues seriously and that believes that, in fact, it is generally speaking quite difficult to maintain at least robust, well-functioning democracies. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So what are the big problems? <clears throat> the core idea behind democracy's sort of moral claim uh, is this idea that people have a right to govern themselves. They have a right to be in charge of their own lives. This is sort of the, the core of what makes democracy morally compelling to a lot of people. But this causes a bit of a problem. In order to fully express the sort of moral core, we need to regard citizens as morally equal, um, you know, barring uh, edge cases, right? So barring the very young or uh, the, the severely mentally impaired. Um, possibly, though this is controversial and we can talk about it, possibly barring people who have committed certain kinds of crimes. Citizens are morally equal. If the point of democracy is that uh, people have a right to control their own lives, well, that applies to everyone. Um, you know, this is generally thought of on the model of human rights, that this is just something that you, as a human being, you deserve. So, this means that ideally at least, it seems it means that ideally at least, everyone should have a right to equal participation in the democratic government. Um, I don't have any more right to self-determination than you do, so we should all have a right to equally participate. But, first but, governance is actually, this is the, the, the elitist, the, the tempting elitist position. Governance is uh, pretty specialized. Um, not everyone is good at it. Certainly no one is good at every aspect of politics. Um, either good at in the sense of knowing a lot about it, uh, being able to have valuable informed opinions, or good at it in the sense of um, knowing what kinds of policies are likely to work in various, in various areas. So the first is the kind of elitist worry that how is our government going to work if we let everyone participate equally, the people who their participation is going to be high quality and valuable and contribute something, and also the people who are going to be noise. Um, and as we talked about in class, you know, the comforting thought that, okay, well, the people who don't know what they're talking about will basically cancel each other out may not be true, especially in a society where people may be manipulated in systematic ways, or where error may be, may be systematic, um, systematic cognitive biases even, right? Even if you leave out manipulation, for instance, um, one argument that uh, supporters of more restrictive environmental rules often make is that people in general, human beings we just know have a, uh, a short-term bias. Um, so when you're talking about water levels rising over the next 200 years, right? That might be very bad. People might care about it in a sense that they that if they fully appreciated it, they would they would do something about it. 
but when you make them choose between that and an immediate harm, you know, immediate harm like higher taxes, they want to avoid the immediate harm more than the long-term harm. You know, so if there are those kinds of systematic biases, um, let alone manipulation, you may have lots of people who are making bad decisions participating in this process. And the second but, and this is really the kind of minimalist Democrat but, is not everyone cares about politics. Everyone maybe has a right to participate equally, but um, what does it mean for the system if there are lots of people who just don't feel like exercising that right? Uh, your classmates were talking about the Australian compulsory voting thing. Sounded like a lot of Australians don't want to. They find it onerous. Um, is your democracy a good one, in some sense of good, whatever you want out of it, if you have lots of people who are choosing not to exercise their, their, their right to be involved in politics? They would rather just be left alone. So, <clears throat> one solution to these problems is to reject democracy in favor of a kind of guardianship. Uh, we're not going to talk about that option today. Um, generally speaking, most political theorists, most contemporary political theorists, have rejected this as an inegal both an inegalitarian move. It, it too badly undercuts the moral core of what people want out of democracy, um, or even out of general political morality for most part. Uh, for, for most contemporary theorists. Um, and a lot of people think it's imprudent. The, the track record of authoritarian regimes, uh, even the ones that claim the mantle of sincere guardianship, is, is mixed at best. So what's left? Well, the only thing left is to, if, if we don't, if we are not comfortable with people largely not caring and allowing politics to be run by the people who happen to care, often because they're self-interested, right? Um, you know, people care a lot more about politics, for instance, if they're very wealthy and have a very large stake in what happens with government programs, right? Um, they might care a lot about politics if they are very ideologically inclined, if they have very strong views. Um, you know, those are often the, the, the quote-unquote extremists, right? So if we don't want a polity where we just say, look, it's fine, everybody has a right to participate, but in actuality, it's it, most of the decisions are going to be influenced more heavily by, you know, the wealthy and the extremists. And if we are not comfortable just saying, well, everyone will participate, but some people will just not know what they're talking about, the only solution left is to get people to be more interested in politics and better participants in the political process when they're there. And this is <clears throat> what a lot of people, th those two things are, are what make up what a lot of people call civic virtue. So if we're not comfortable with a polity that just lets people be ignorant or be uninvolved if they want to be, uh, we need to increase civic virtue somehow. All right, what is civic virtue? I gave you the very broad kind of idea. It's about wanting to be part of the political process and being good in some sense of good at being part of the political process. Um, like with human rights, there are a few different categories people have of things people have proposed that are part of civic virtue. Uh, not everyone's agreed on this, and there have been historical changes in what tends to be on the list of, of thinkers that care about civic virtue. So one thing you might want to consider is um, whether there is something like an eternal civic virtue, or whether in some way civic virtue, what counts as civic virtue has to be keyed to the kind of political system or economic system or social system that's in place at a time. Um, you know, this is both sort of a just interesting reflection and also might be relevant for policy once we start talking about inculcating things about how much things should sort of change with the times. All right. So one class of things that people have cons that people have suggested as civic virtues are things that might be considered general virtues. Things that just make you a good person in general, not necessarily a good citizen. So um, courage, willingness to abide by the rules, uh, temperance sometimes uh, shows up on, uh, on the list, generosity, um, honesty. 
And there are a lot of thinkers who think that it just is not possible to be a good citizen and a bad person. Um, in fact, I think most civic Republicans think that to some extent civic virtue is going to be tied to general moral virtue. Though they may not be exactly the same thing. One kind of place where this question arises is, for instance, um, what do we want to say about politicians who may be worthy politicians in a lot of ways, but seem to have bad personal character. So the um, the big example, at least for people of around my age, is Bill Clinton, right? A lot of people like Bill Clinton as a president. A lot of people loved uh, his policies. Um, you know, I think probably a lot of people who weren't thrilled with his policies uh, respected him as someone who sort of knew how to be president, who was good at promoting his agenda, who knew how to be a scrapper in the bureaucratic process. Um, you know, so there are a lot of ways in which we might want to say Bill Clinton was a was was good at being a president, um, or at least you know you don't have to agree, but I think you can you can recognize there are a lot of people who thought that. On the other hand, plenty of the people who thought that he was good at being a president wouldn't let him date their daughters, right? Plenty of people who thought that Bill Clinton was a wonderful president thought he was a, a kind of a, a bad human being, right? He was an immoral person, um, and one of the big arguments over Clinton was. How much should we care about that? Should it matter to us in terms of assessing him as a political leader that he seemed to lack in certain personal virtues, right? And Bill Clinton's not the only one to get slammed on this. Um, you know, if you want examples from the other side, there's constant, you know, there's schadenfreude on the left every time some Republican uh, or conservative more generally gets caught, you know, committing adultery or uh, be, you know, this, you could probably make a list of, you know, conservative anti-gay pol politicians who it turns out are secretly gay, right? And, you know, there are a lot of people who, 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 who sort of, um, you know, cackle over these sorts of things that, that come out where the personal virtues of the individual don't match up with uh, the, the, the virtues they're promoting as a politician. So, Anyway, long way around the block, but this is a serious. This is actually a really serious question about whether or not we should care that people who are participants in the political process don't uh, exhibit personal moral virtue, whether these things are connected or not. Okay, a second class, and this is a very um, so connecting citizenship up with the moral general moral virtues is very characteristic of classical thinkers on civic virtue. Aristotle, for instance. And in fact, some of the classical thinkers, Aristotle in particular, actually more or less define moral virtue in terms of civic virtue. So for Aristotle, for instance, what's in, why it is that the good person is courageous is, in a, is, is essentially because the good citizen is courageous. For Aristotle, politics is kind of the master science. Politics is the science of human nature, um, because uh, Aristotle calls uh, human beings zoon politikon, uh, the, the, the political animal. It's our nature to, be, to come together in communities. Um, and so the virtues that make you a good participant in the life of the community just are the moral virtues. More characteristic of um, more contemporary notions of civic virtue, um, ones you'll see with uh, some of the founding fathers, um, ones you'll see with some kinds of uh, conservative commentators, I want to say Buckley, but I'm not looking at things right now, um, are to say that, well, there's a number of economic virtues that are important parts of civic virtue. Roughly speaking, um, because the economic life of the political community is a key part of what the political life is there to support and defend. Um, you can, of course, read this in a sinister way if you want, um, but it's intended not to be read in a sinister way. It's just this idea that you want your nation to be prosperous. You want your political community to be prosperous. And so those who participate in politics 
must have the kinds of virtues that allow individuals to prosper and hence will scale up to them being good at helping the community prosper. So things like thrift or industry or adaptability to changing circumstances are things that uh, this sort of picture thinks the citizen must have, right? The citizen must be thrifty personally so that she'll understand, um, you know, that when governments make decisions about how much to spend, that they need to make intelligent and sometimes difficult trade-offs. Um, that's the basic idea. Some people would like to add um, so certain kinds of social virtues. Now, there's going to be some bleed. There's bleed for all of these, right? Especially for social virtues and, and moral virtues, there's going to be a special bleed. But certain kinds of social virtues, virtues about the way we relate to other people. So, having an open mind, being tolerant, um, being independent. Uh, we talked about a little bit this idea that was very persuasive to a lot of people around the founding of the US that citizens need to have a certain a, a amount of both kind of mental and material independence from others so that they will not be swayed too easily right nowadays we we talk intuitively about this where when we talk about people making their decisions about what candidate to support or what policy to support based on watching TV ads or you know not listening to talk radio or the daily show instead of doing their own research right this is a kind of independence criticism the kind of person who will vote for whoever John Stewart or Rush Limbaugh or uh, Al Franken or you know Chuck D says to vote for, um, we think, well, this person, this person is not showing the kind of social independence from peer pressure, um, the kind of willingness to go against the herd that we need our citizens to exhibit. And finally, and I guess this is also bleeds a lot into the social virtues, there may be certain kinds of specific political virtues, uh, things that might not otherwise in some cases might not otherwise be as important if not for the fact that you're talking about politics, right? You can imagine that courage would be important whether or not you have a political community at all. But something like uh, non-dogmatism um, or respect for people who have divergent ideological perspectives might be necessary for a citizenry, right? So think about the respect for respect for other people who have other positions. You know, we complain here in the U.S. a lot about partisan gridlock. Um, and one of the ideas, one of the perennial things that comes up, and this is behind a lot of proposals for, you know, a moderate party or a third party or bipartisan coalitions, is the idea that our politics will go better if people of differing views can come together with mutual respect and discuss things and find compromises and find solutions that are satisfying to everyone. So, um, This is sort of, sort of a large basket. Uh, not everyone has the same views on this. Not all thinkers have had the same views. One of the big splits, as I mentioned before, well, I think there are two big splits that you should keep in mind. One is the question of whether or not civic virtue is really part of general overall virtue. And so if we're promoting civic virtue, uh, what we're really doing is promoting people being just good overall, just being good people. Or are we promoting some specific subset that is both compatible with you being civically virtuous but personally immoral? And also, perhaps more importantly for a, a multicultural, um, pluralistic society, can we promote a kind of civic virtue that can be agnostic about what you think it means to be personally virtuous? And then the second, the separate, I think the second major issue to keep in mind is the question of whether or not civic virtue is a matter of particularly um, sort of social and political virtues or whether economic virtues are, should also be considered uh, part of it. Those tend to be where the, the fights happen. All right. One key civic virtue that is dear to the heart of uh, a lot of contemporary political philosophers, especially ones like Kimlicka and um, 
well, like a lot of people, who are influenced by Rawls, is the idea that citizens must be publicly reasonable. Um, and a lot of the other things that you want out of citizens are there to support a kind of public reasonableness. The basic bedrock idea behind this is that in a well-functioning polity, decisions are not made just by replacing a physical fight with a voting fight. Mere majority voting is not enough to get you good decision making. There needs to be, and you can see the echoes in the Dolly and Polyarchy, you can see the echoes in the Deliberative Democrats, there needs to be something going on besides just the exercise of raw power. Um, and that extra thing that needs to be going on, you know, in raw power, voting power is a kind of power, right? If, if all you're doing is threatening that, look, do this or lots of people will vote against you, that's still just an exercise of power. The extra thing that's usually considered to be needed is something like the giving of reasons. What makes a democracy robust? What allows it to produce good policy? What allows it to be healthy and sustainable and not collapse into some kind of uh, venality or elite capture? An important part of that, a lot of folks think, is that people give reasons for their position and engage with other people as reasonable people, as people who are giving reasons in the public sphere. Um, so in a lot of ways, the idea is that political decisions generally ought to be more like judicial decisions. Um, you know, we, we don't allow, well, we do with their denying or granting satoriare, but um, in terms of the actual decisions, right, the Supreme Court doesn't just vote. The Supreme Court also then submits an opinion that explains its vote. And that's the kind of idea. Not that everyone should have to submit a brief, um, you know, before they vote on anything, uh, probably not even the representatives, but that there should be an expectation that decisions get made on the basis of reasons and that people will present their reasons and will try to make decisions in terms of reasons, not just in terms of the threats that are made. Okay, in order to, I don't know if that makes any sense, but in order to support this kind of vision of what you need to add to the political life of the community besides just fair voting in order to make it uh, good and sustainable, um, is uh, first, the reasons that you give need to be they should be reasons for everyone, reasons that everyone could accept. Now, the could here is a little bit weird um, in that it's not immediately obvious what force of could there is, right? There's, a, there's of course, some sense in which all reasons are ones that somebody could accept, right? Somebody accepts it, so you could. The, the, the typical kind of distinction that people who support this want to make, though, is between reasons that appeal to general ideas and reasons that require you to have a membership in some particular group or outlook before they can even be reasons for you. So um, the big classes of reasons that are supposed to be excluded on this are, generally speaking, religious reasons and ideological reasons. So the problem is basically this. You know, imagine we're arguing about gay marriage. And I say, look, gay marriage is great and wonderful and we should allow it. And you say, no, it's horrible and we should thwart it. If I ask you why, and you say, well, we should thwart it because Jesus said gay marriage is terrible, right? Bracket whether Jesus actually said that, right? Um, the problem is this sort of ends the conversation. Unless I am a Christian, I don't have any particular reason either to believe that that's what Jesus said or, or possibly that Jesus said anything. And I don't have any particular reason to care about it. Right? It's the kind of reason that that Jesus said it is the kind of reason that matters only to Christians. The other kind of issue, ideological ones, might have a very similar kind of, uh, kind of character. Um, 
you know, if I say, look, we, we ought to have universal health care, and you say, why? And I say, well, because um, Marxist analysis of the class struggle says that we need to have it. Well, you know, if you're not a Marxist, you're not going to care that much. Um, and so the idea is that we need to give each other reasons that even if we don't accept them, they're at least the kind of things that we could accept, right? If I say to you, um, we have to have universal health care because uh, it's more economically efficient, then the idea is that's a sort of thing. You might not agree with me. Um, you might not even think that economic efficiency is the overall main thing we should be looking for, right? You might say, well, I'm a libertarian, and I agree it would be economically efficient, but that's not a good enough reason to take away people's rights, right? Or something like that. Um, but it's, in some sense, the kind of reason that makes sense to you. It appeals to things that we all care about, right? We all presumably care about, um, you know, whether or not things are efficient, even if it's not the only thing we care about. This is a really mushy kind of criterion, though, and one that often uh, needs to be very carefully considered, and sometimes, honestly, in the literature, is not very well worked out. Because you do get into certain kinds of problems, right? If, if I say to you, you know, if, if I say to you, look, I can't accept your Jesus-y reasons because I, I'm not a Christian, um, then you might say, well, but you you could be, you know, come to church, let Jesus into your heart and he will come, right? Uh, and if I reject that kind of thing, then why am I allowed to say something like, which most supporters want me to be able to say, why am I allowed to say something like, um, look, you reject my environmental science, um, but, uh, you know, go learn some science and you'll understand. And it turns out to be kind of difficult to exactly specify why it's okay for me to, why it's okay to tell someone that they need to go and become learned in science, um, but not that they need to go and let Jesus into their heart. There are plenty of attempts to do this, but, it, but it's actually a kind of a difficult, a difficult thing. Um, and one way to solve it is to say, well, we give the reasons that everyone in our community can accept, just whatever happens to be the overlap. And that's interesting and fine and Rawlsian, but it raises a lot of the problems we talked about with human rights, about finding a kind of lowest to common denominator view. All right. I talked a lot about that one because that one's kind of problematic. Besides giving reasons everyone can accept, uh, your reasons have to, uh, on this kind of view, a publicly reasonable reason has to exhibit respect for the moral equality of persons, right? So this just bars um, things like we ought to uh, get rid of welfare because white people are superior, right? White supremacists are just ruled out of court on this as not being publicly reasonable. Um, and, you know, the intuitive idea behind it is that if you've got a community that includes people of all sorts of different groups, uh, you can't start your political, you can't have a healthy community like that if you start your political discussion from the assumption that some groups are, are better than others or more morally equal than others. Um, like the deliberative Democrats, public reasonableness, reasonableness aims at creating principled compromise. The goal of all of this is not just to create outcomes that maximize the interest of various conflicting fact factions. That's not bad. You know, if you can do that, okay, sometimes that's what you can do. But the ideal is to get beyond what we could get th get through just sort of power ne power based negotiations to new solutions, new and interesting ways of looking at things, um, policies that split the difference, policies that grow the pie, um, policies that we can accept not just because we say, all right, well, we lost this fight, but we'll win the next one. But once we can say, well, we actually, we came up with something that, that satisfies all of us. And the reason to care about this, part of it is just because, you know, hey, that's awesome. Um, the other reason to care about this is that, remember, a lot of the stuff about citizenship is a concern about the sustainability of your democracy, whether or not you can maintain a healthy democracy. And one of the big threats to a healthy democracy is people deciding that your democracy is illegitimate. People deciding that they don't want to put in the work. They don't want to listen to the rules. Um, and if they don't see the rules as legitimate, if they don't see the rules as ones they can endorse, that becomes a, a bigger a, a bigger threat, right? This is, of course, the threat that lies behind things like, you know, if I'm not white and the rules are made by white supremacists, I'm 
probably not going to care that much about them. Um, similarly, the principal compromise aims at getting a bunch of rules that people can actually endorse, not just accept because, well, we lost fair and square, but actually say, yeah, I think that's a good rule. And the idea is by being, by giving reasons, instead of just saying, look, I want X and you want Y, let's fight. By explaining why I want X and you explaining why you want Y, we can understand the positions better, we can dig deeper, and we can find ways of satisfying all the things that we're really concerned about. And the last benefit that is often claimed for this is that um, public reasonableness may be especially beneficial to marginalized or minority groups. Remember, one thing we talked about when talking about tyranny of the majority is that permanent minorities in democracies can, without the right kinds of protections, be in a dangerous spot. Uh, you know, if you're in the if you're in the ten percent minority of something and everything's decided by voting, well, you may never get your way. Having a element of the public discourse that focuses on um, other things besides power may be especially beneficial to groups that don't have as much of other kinds of power. So if a minority group uh, can make the case, a publicly reasonable case that cannot be refuted publicly reasonably, for their interests, they may be able to get more of it than if than if we just had a system that relies on people using their voting power uh, to get what they want. So the idea is that if you have a system where people are, for the most part, publicly reasonable in this way, it helps to keep your democracy sustainable and vibrant. If everybody is really committed to this, then people will both respect others' views and respect the rules that are made based on others' views and will do their part to sustain that by, in their turn, giving other people reasons to respect their views. Um, so ideally, this will lead to a system where people have less reason to be cynical, less reason to be resistant, um, where outcomes will be better for everybody. Um, and hence one that will be will be healthier and longer lasting and, and less subject to undermining. Um, you know, both because people will be engaged and care about it uh, and also because the kinds of undermining threats are harder to do if you're being publicly reasonable. Um, you know, if your whole argument for why there should be whatever, the whole argument for why there should be farm subsidies is I'm a farmer and I like money well, that's not going to go too far if people are really con are really concerned about uh, public reasonableness. Okay. Oh, and the last thing, you know, some people might see this as a con that it, that it benefits uh, disproportionately benefits marginalized or, or minority groups because it might be seen as giving them outsized power in the system. Uh, something we can talk about. All right. One objection that a lot of people bring up, and you know, the, you can, you can, if you listen carefully, you can hear the minimalist Democrats in the back room going Dit, dat, mm, and choking on stuff. Is this this sounds really hard? Um, living up to public reasonableness, um, especially if we consider this not just a matter of what you need to do if you are going to make a case in the public sphere. But if we consider this a matter of what you need to do in general, if you're going to be a participant at all, right? So public reasonableness is not just a virtue on this kind of view for politicians. It's a virtue for all of us. We shouldn't go out and vote on this kind of view without having the having all of these civic virtues, right? We shouldn't go out and vote just on, you know, even if I'm just doing the privacy of the voting booth, I shouldn't go out and vote on white supremacist principles, right? That's wrong even if I'm not promoting it in the public sphere. I'm just voting on it. Uh, I ought to myself be sure that I give reasons to people. I seek out others who, with whom I can have discussions. I, I learn to respect their views. I, I try to, to, to learn as much as I can about their positions. You know, beyond public reasonableness, I... I, I inculcate courage and temperance. I try to be a good person. Um, you know, I, I I spend time introspecting and, and 
weeding out my subconscious biases and then going out and having conversations with people and this sort of thing, right? Uh, especially, you know, one thing that we should add to this picture is that for most of the virtue theorists, virtue is not something that happens just in your mind. If I want to respect others' viewpoints, I need to actually go out and engage with them. I can't just sit in my room at home alone saying, well, I respect others' viewpoints. I, I think that if I ever listened to them, I would respect them. No! I'm not respecting it unless I'm actually going out and talking with them, having these long political conversations. So, a lot of people just say, look, this is hard. I got, I got stuff to do, you know, TV's not going to watch itself. My kids aren't going to raise themselves. I got to make dinner, you know. The Orioles, they're not going to lose on their own. I got to go watch the game. You know, there's there's just so much other stuff in my life that I want to do. Why should I be doing all of this? This sounds really hard. The promise of democracy was that I was going to get to vote on what I liked, and now you're telling me I'm it sounds like I'm going to be in meet, meetings a lot. Um, you know, why am I going to do any of this? <laughs> the classical view, and this is, uh, so this kind of argument is often described as a debate between the liberty of the ancients and the liberty of the moderns. It's often described as a sort of clash in what people think freedom means. So, the idea is that the liberty of the moderns, we think of liberty now, us moderns, as freedom from the polity. Freedom to do your own thing and to ignore the people around you as much as possible. Freedom from obligations to other human beings as much as possible. Right? The polity is there, the government is there to keep everybody out of everybody else's way so we don't have to care. And that's what freedom is. Freedom is, I can come home, and I can spend my money on a big screen TV so I can watch Dancing with the Stars. Um, or, you know, it doesn't have to be that sort of petty, right? It can be, freedom means I can come home and I can, you know, do my art. Or I can spend my money volunteering for a charity or something. Though that might actually be a Liberty of the Ancients kind of thing, right? Okay. So, the Liberty of the Ancients is a very different notion of freedom. And the classical view of why you should do all this hard stuff, why you should engage with your fellow citizens, why you should inculcate virtue in yourself, why you should become informed, why you should participate as much as you can in the political process, is that basically that's what freedom is. So for a lot of the ancients, a lot of the classical theorists, the reason why you should do all of this stuff is that freedom as being a participant in the rule of the community, being able to direct the community in ways that you think are valuable, that's a more important kind of freedom than sort of mere individual freedom. So if you ask Aristotle, why should I go do all this hard stuff? Aristotle is going to tell you that's what being a person is. You're de if, if, if all you do is sort of go home and live your private life, uh, and you mostly stay out of other people's way and, and hope that they mostly stay out of yours, except for you know your friends and other chosen connections, you're not living a fully human life, right? You're not doing what humans should do. You have a very de defective kind of freedom. Now, this may sound really overbearing, but... You know, this is the kind of idea that has a lot of traction in a lot of political conversations even now. Think about arguments about China, for instance. I hear a lot of, you know, I, as I have said in class before, I am, I am largely ignorant about China. Um, but you hear a lot of arguments about China, whether these are accurate to China or not, that there's something deeply wrong with a system that provides increasing amounts of economic freedom, but not political freedom. And the, the sort of the moral intuition, I think, that drives this kind of concern is that a lot of people think a political system where you can have whatever job you want, you can make money, you can have a lot of material goods, 
but where you don't get a say in what your government does, where you can't criticize the government, where you can't change, you know, participate in changing policy if you want to, that that's a system that, that nonetheless prevents people from having fully free human lives, even if they are quite materially comfortable. Um, so, yeah. There's still some grip to the liberty of the ancients. The class, So the classical view of why we should do this is that this is just what it means to be a good human being, to be a, to have a human a worthwhile human life. Um, there are contemporary theorists who take a more instrumental uh, argument. They still support the idea that we all ought to be doing a lot of the civic virtue stuff. We all ought to be participating in politics. We ought to be inculcating the virtues necessary to participate in politics. But not because this is somehow the best way to live your life, and we know that, but because this is needed to keep the institutions working properly. Uh, they essentially take on board the idea that what's good in human life is whatever you, you know, ultimately the, what, what's good in human life is to be able to do the things that you happen to personally find valuable and enjoyable. Um, and government is there in some extent to make it possible for individuals to do the things that they find valuable and enjoyable. But you, you can't, the system will not be sustainable if people ignore it. Um, if all you do is what you find valuable and enjoyable, uh, eventually the government will become corrupt and problematic and authoritarian and will stop you from doing the valuable, enjoyable things that you were trying to do. So you need to sort of put in the spade work of civic virtue to protect your personal freedom. Um, this is a weaker kind of thing. For one, uh, it makes civic virtue somewhat optional in basically just regimes. If the government, as long as the government is working fairly well, actual participation and actual exercise of civic virtue may not be that important, um, and or it might only be important as a kind of reserve capacity, right? People need a certain amount of civic virtue so that things start to go sour, they are prepared to defend, uh, defend their liberties. Um, it's more focused on ensuring that everyone is able to participate, not just in terms of formal openness of the system, but also in terms of making sure that everybody has at least a basic level of civic virtue so that if they feel called to participate or if things become unjust, they're ready to go. This is a kind of instrumental version. You know, the instead of civic instead of civic virtue being what allows you to be a fully free human being. Uh, on this kind of picture, civic virtue is um, what allows you to be able to defend your personal freedoms uh, should that become necessary. All right, so how do we do all of this? So this is sort of where the policy rubber meets the road and where things become problematic. Lots of people, if you describe civic virtue, they say, yeah, that sounds wonderful, we should all do that. Great. Well, the problem is, um, how do we get people to be virtuous? And the reason this is both a pol is is a policy issue and a policy problem is that if it is the case, if you buy that a democracy will only be robust and healthy and sustainable if the citizens of the democracy have civic virtue, then it seems that the political community quite likely expressed through the government, but the political community more generally has an interest in promoting civic virtue, has an interest in ensuring that the citizens have civic virtue, and hence that it, it might be legitimate or, or even obligatory to undertake government policies that promote and nurture and foster civic virtue. And, if you've been looking, glancing at the slide, uh, given where civic virtue is often thought to develop, this may justify relatively invasive government policies. It may justify government taking a hand in some areas of life that are often considered part of the private and personal sphere. Um, the basic reason is that 
virtue is not just about the rules you follow, right? When we talk about someone being courageous, we're not talking just about the fact that they follow the rules even if it's dangerous to do so, or if they might lose something if they do so. Be, you know, the, just the very language of it points out, being courageous is a thing you are, not just a thing you do. Being reasonable, being tolerant, being thrifty, having these virtues are about the kind of person you are. So when the government, if the government takes an interest in promoting virtue, it's not just about putting some rules in place that people must follow. The whole problem to start with for democracies is that having the rules, having the institutions, may be meaningless if people are not committed to them, if people don't exhibit the virtues that make them work properly, right? No matter what rule we have about campaign finance, if people just don't care enough, corporations, wealthy individuals, whoever, they'll find a way around it. It's an arms race, right? The only way that we'll actually keep a handle on these things is if people are actually or people are committed to them. So the rules won't sustain themselves. The rules will be sustainable only by the right kind of people. And now, you know, you can give a very creepy read to this, right? If I, This is basically saying that the government may very well have an interest in ensuring that citizens are the right kind of people. All right, well, how do you become the kind of person that you are? There's a few standard answers, uh, relatively uncontroversial, at least in the sense that people believe this is how you become the kind of person you are, how you get the virtues you have. Um, very controversial often in terms of uh, whether or not anyone has a right to try to make sure you become the right kind of person. One is through family or upbringing. Um, we learn most of our moral values in our childhood. This is where we form a lot of our moral ideas. Um, and so we are very heavily influenced by the family that raises us or whatever other kind of upbringing we might have. Um, this is often the, f the, the family is often the first site of virtue. So if you have a family in which, you know, if you're brought up in a family in which everyone's point of view is respected, you are likely to grow up to be the kind of person who takes respecting everyone's point of view to be normal and natural, right? If you grow up in a family where there are strict rules and everyone is expected to follow the rules, you are likely, teenage rebellion aside, to grow up being the kind of person who believes that people ought to follow the rules. Um, family is possibly one of the least controversial places where we develop our moral virtues and our moral character. Possibly one of the most controversial places in terms of what, if anything, government should do about it. Um, one of the things to, to notice about this is that different kinds of concepts of the family are often highly politically charged. Thinking that, for instance, thinking that the family is a space where there are people with natural legitimate authority um, who need to bring up children who don't yet know right from wrong and give them a strong sense of right and wrong that follows a traditional set of rules. You know, this is very closely tied to certain kinds of political outlook. Um, and if the government were to intervene, for instance, say, no, family should be about, you know, we should have rules that, for instance, undercut the authority of the father in families, um, or that undercut the authority of the family over their children entirely. Um, in order to inculcate other kinds of values, well, this might be deeply problematic, right? So this all sounds very abstract, but I'm thinking of things like, 
how much should the government be able to tell you what your children have to learn, right? If you think that it's a traditional rule that um, homosexuality is wrong, or if you think that it is a it is important uh, to recognize the specialness of human beings apart from the natural world, that this is a core element of a proper morality, should the government be able to say, no, you know, your children have to go to a public school where, they'll, where they'll, they will learn that um, gay people have citizenship rights and uh, where they will learn that evolution is the true scientific theory. Um, it's kind of a hard question. Uh, and it's not one that's easily answerable if you believe that civic virtue is important. It's not one that's easily answerable and there's not one that's easy to split the difference on. Um, if you believe that civic virtue is important, you're going to say, look, it may not be the case that any kind of family upbringing is just as good um, for, uh, for citizenship. Now, traditionally, in the U.S. at least, a focus on quote-unquote family values tends to be the province of conservatives. But you can see this as just as much an issue for, for liberals, right? Um, Liberals who want to say, look, gay marriage should be fine, uh, children should have a lot of rights, public education should teach you about diverse cultures and this sort of thing, are as much promoting a picture of upbringing, uh, of appropriate upbringing as conservatives. There's just different ones. Okay, leave that aside. Another way you might develop it is through political practice itself. This is the, 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 the fake it till you make it or practice makes perfect kind of view. Mill was a fan of this view. Dahl, we talked about, is a fan of this view. Um, it might be that one of the best ways, especially if you think that the core of civic virtue is the political virtues, one of the best ways to develop civic virtue might just be through exercising it. Um, we might want to promote people participating in politics. You know, the more meetings you go to, the better you'll be at being at meetings. The more political discussions you're in, the better uh, your contributions to them will be. A lot of people think it'd be through participation in civil society. Uh, so the idea is that if you, even if you're not doing a lot of sort of big P political stuff, you're not going to rallies, you're not going to party meetings, but you are volunteering in your local soup kitchen, or you are a big participant in your uh, your church. We'll get back to the churches in a second. Um, or even, you know, you're the treasurer for your local, you know, basketball team or something. That this can be a good site for civic virtue. And a lot of people will say, look, being the treasurer for a basketball team, right? Uh, being the person who brings snacks for your weekly book club. These are not things that... Um, do basketball teams have treasures? I may have just made that up. All right. Anyway, these are not things that are big P political, but you learn a lot of the same virtues, right? If you're helping run a basketball team, you learn things like how to have calm discussions with people, right? How to be reliable and show up on time. How to, uh, you know, work at things until you, until you do well at them. How to understand where other people are coming from. Just being part of human interaction, um, you know, how to work for a team instead of for yourself as an individual, right? Being part of human interactions like this help cultivate the kinds of virtues you need for the big, big human interactions of politics. And then finally, um, the last place, and this is the place where there's typically the most policy intervention, though it's far from uncontroversial, is through public education. Uh, or through education in general. You develop civic virtue by uh, being taught certain things, maybe much despite being taught civic virtue, right? Your my my daughter is four, goes to preschool, and already you know they teach her uh, patriotism, basically. Uh, you know, I'll pick her up and she'll say, "Daddy, that's the American flag. It means you love your country," right? Uh, you know, if she is taught consistently as she grows up that we ought to love our country good chance that you'll grow up believing that you ought to love your country, right? And you ought to do things that are good for the country as a whole, not just for you as an individual. It's important civic virtue um, for a lot of people. 
And it's, you know, not uncontroversial, but certainly a very common kind of thing, uh, you know, to have children say pledges of allegiance, to have them learn the history from a certain perspective, to take classes on civics where they, they, they talk about the way you ought to be a citizen. There are two more controversial kinds of things, and these are controversial not that they're more controversial and that the government should get involved, but more controversial that they're important sites where you learn virtues. One is through, uh, through the market. For the folks, um, people like Weber, who believe that economic virtues are important civic virtues, um, and this is you know, kind of associated with a more conservative line, but doesn't have to be exclusive, exclusive to them. Uh, participation in the market might be an important part of what makes you virtuous. You know, there's a kind of um, less theoretical version of this that's current in the U.S. now, right? Um, a lot of people in the U.S. have suspicions about the civic virtue of, for instance, people who work for the government or people who get their money from public assistance or people who, you know, teachers, for instance, uh, you know, folks who are perceived as being shielded from the market that folks who live lives that are not market-based might not develop the right kind of virtues, you know. Um, and similarly, you know, the flip side of this is that there are a lot of folks who, I'm going to say venerate, but venerate is probably too strong. A lot of folks who respect people who are successful in the market because of the presumption that they must have uh, inculcated certain virtues, right? Entrepreneurs are a highly honored group in in a modern American society. You know, we might not care, you know, Paris Hilton we might make fun of because she inherited her money, but especially people who made their money, right? Um, especially, I mean, my goodness, people who made their money from scratch are, you know, they're heroes. Uh, and part of it is that they, they, they exhibit human virtues that people want to emulate, that people think is valuable to emulate. And some people think they exhibit civic virtues, right? Um, this seems like a million years ago, but but George W. Bush um, ran in part on a platform that he would run the country like a businessman. And a lot of people thought that was a good idea, right? That the showing the virtues that a businessman must have, you know, focus on entrepreneurship, uh, thrift, money management, uh, you know, these sorts of things would be good things in a president, not just good things for a businessman. The other more controversial answer is that you might learn these things through religion. Now, it's relatively uncontroversial that religious groups as civil society organizations, right, as places where you come together with other people to do stuff and get stuff done together, are places where you can learn the civic virtues, right? Even people who don't believe in religion can say, well, yeah, being part of your church um, could be a place where you learn civic virtues just because a church is an organization. Other folks have, have, have thought that, no, the religion itself is important. Um, one of the big uh, sort of thumbnail sketch arguments for this would be that arguably one very important civic virtue is a focus on the common good. You know, a willingness to engage in self-sacrifice for the good of the community. You know, whether it's it doesn't have to be like you go to war and get killed self-sacrifice. It can just be you pay your taxes uh, self-sacrifice. And so some people have argued that religion is specially important because religion teaches a focus on something besides your own interests in this world. Um, and so there have been a lot of theorists who have argued that the government does in fact have an interest in either promoting religion in general or even in promoting particular religions um, as sort of most consonant with the development of civic virtue. Obviously a kind of controversial view, especially if you tie it to a policy of, of promoting religion. Um, even controversial in terms of development of virtue, you know, atheists will, will be quite vehement that even folks who do not believe in religion can, ha can, be, can be virtuous. But, you know, important argument. All right. So, so far, I've been talking for like an hour about what citizens need to do, and you might think, well, uh, hold on. Citizens, all right, fine. You know, yeah, we can do some stuff, but what about our leaders, right? 
Um, a lot of people think that the problem, you know, so there are a lot of people who think that the problem with modern democracies is that the citizenry are ignorant and out to lunch. But at least as many people think that the big problem with modern democracies is that the leadership are venal. They don't do what they're supposed to. They're corrupt. So what would it mean for leaders to be good leaders? You know, we a lot of people don't think, for instance, that an institutional system is sufficient, right? One way of thinking about leadership, the kind of non-virtue requiring way, is it is the version of separation of powers that at least, you know, I learned in school. This idea that, look, you set it up so that politicians need to get reelected and so that the president and Congress and the courts all have an interest in maintaining their own power against against the other two. This will combine to keep the politicians honest because they'll want to get reelected, so they'll want to do what the people want. And they won't be able to get away too easily with fooling the people because, for instance, if the president is trying to get away with something that the people don't want, Congress will have an immediate reason to call him on it and to fight him over it. Um, also that uh, if there's confusion or dissent about what the people want, the fact that everyone is, is responsible uh, in some way to the electorate and is, has incentives to fight each other will tend to grind things to a halt rather than allowing bad stuff to happen. All right, this is a kind of picture where we think, it doesn't matter, right? President Obama could be the devil himself, but his interest in getting reelected and his interest in maximizing his own power relative to Congress and the courts should lead him to basically do things that are good for America. If you don't buy that kind of liberal picture of how things should go, small l liberalism again here, and you think that politicians, members of the government themselves need to exhibit a kind of civic virtue, well, what is this consistent? What does it mean to be a good leader? Um, and this, it also turns out, is not a terribly easy question to answer. Some folks, uh, especially those who have not focused specifically on democracy, like Machiavelli, uh, speaking of, go read the discourses, don't just read the prints, but um, have taken this to be just a kind of vir version of the civic virtue, virtue that everyone is supposed to exhibit. Aristotle is in this kind of, uh, this kind of position as well, uh, especially since the Aristotelian models that he was thinking of uh, there wasn't, it was much more like a direct democracy, at least for the, in the citizen, class of citizens was restricted, but then they, they engage a lot more directly than we do. Um, so they say, well, look, you know, the, the representatives, basically what they need to be is, you know, just and self-restrained and focused on the common good and tolerant and open-minded and knowledgeable and all the things that citizens should be. But especially for a representative government, there are special questions that arise. Um, and this is, sort of the problem of representation. And again, as I mentioned before in, in class, think of the term representative broadly. Certainly, you know, your big R representatives, if you're, if you're an American, the, the people who sit in the House of Representatives are your representatives. But the president is also your representative. He stands in for you. Uh, members of the government bureaucracy are also your representatives. Uh, members of the military are your representatives. They act on your behalf. Um, and so they represent you in some broader way. But the question is, what exactly does this mean, right? The obvious kind of representative would be one that's similar to you in some way. Um, we often don't talk about this explicitly as a desideratum for a representative, though sometimes we do, right? When, when people complain that there are not enough African Americans or women in Congress, this is tied to a view that at least one thing your representative should be doing is literally representing you, looking like you, being not just looking, but being someone who is like you, right? Uh, one thing we talked about uh, in class was, is it a problem that Congress is full of lawyers? You know, most Americans are not lawyers. Lawyers might be really good at promoting the interests of people who are not lawyers, right? because they, they're doing it through law, so they, they know a lot about the system. But should we also have people who are not lawyers there because lawyers aren't going to see things the right way? 
So there is some some grip to this. And if you go back to the remember one of the complaints about guardianship is that the guardians, even if they're sincere, um, first of all, they might not be sincere, right? We might be worried that lawyers will do things that are good for lawyers if they can get away with it. If the place is packed with lawyers, they'll all, they'll all combine and agree to do it. Um, but we also might worry that even if they're totally sincere. If you get a bunch of lawyers in the room and ask them, hey, lawyers, what's good for poor people, right? They might give you a bad answer, even if they're being totally sincere. They just don't understand. Um, this tends to not be what we focus on, though. Um, so if it's not that, well, what could it be? Maybe it's do what the represented people want. But here you've got a couple kinds of ambiguities. First is... Um, who are they represented again? Especially in a democracy, there can be kind of a fight about this. And here I will name check The Daily Show uh, the way I threatened to in class the other day. John Bolton was on The Daily Show. This must be oh, must be like five years ago now because it was still the Bush administration. Um, and he and... Uh, John Stewart were so John Bolton. For those of you who who, who were sleeping, uh, John Bolton, uh, of course, was the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. Uh, during during George W. Bush's tenure, um, and he and John Stewart were discussing various things. Um, and one of the things that they argued about was Bolton said, "Look, uh, President Bush was elected by you know fifty. It was fifty one point something percent of the electorate." Uh, and his responsibility is to do what that 51% want. Uh, you know, his, his responsibility is to represent them. And Stewart's argument was, well, no, uh, you know, he should be the president of everybody, not just the president of the people who voted for him. He should do what everybody wants, not just what the, the, the people who voted for him want. And, uh, you know, that's a real divide in terms of thinking about what the representative is supposed to do. Um, a different way of thinking, you know, we, we've talked a lot about money in politics in class. Um, are the represented the people who contribute most to your campaign? This sounds really evil, but maybe it's not, right? If the people who came out and supported you and pushed for you are either, you know, people with money or people with, you know, time and fire in their bellies who, who really wanted you, maybe you should do what they want, right? Why, why should you care as much maybe about what the mushy middle who didn't really care that much to put you there want, right? They might just be kind of happy with whatever. Uh, maybe you should pay special attention to your strongest backers. The other kind of ambiguity with what the represented want is, um, this is sort of, there's a deep metaphysical side of this and an easy, pragmatic, intuitive side of this, and I'll try to focus on the latter, is there's a certain sense in which we have elected representatives because at least in detail, I don't know what I want about a lot of this stuff. Um, if you replace what I want with something like what I would do in your position, you can get all sorts of weirdness, right? First of all, like if I say, look, I want, um, you know, my, my representative is Elijah Cummings, right? I want Elijah Cummings, when he goes to the House of Representatives, I want him to do what I would do if I was there. Well, I don't know. I mean, if I was there, I might want to go home. Uh, you know, beyond that kind of weirdness, you get things like, well, do I really want him to do what I would do? Because I'm not really all that well-educated about some of the things that he wants to do, right? Um, I'm not an expert in municipal tax policy, Right or well, you wouldn't be doing municipal, right? I'm not. I'm not an expert in tax policy. It's not. It's not my area of expertise. I have some ideas about it, um, but on the other hand, if he knows a lot more about tax policy than I policy than I do, uh, maybe what I would do would be stupid, right? Maybe I want him to do not what I would do. Uh, I want him to do something entirely different from what I would do. I, you know, maybe I want him to do what I would do if I was a representative and was fully informed, but now we're pretty far away from, from what I would actually do. Okay, so a different kind of view. We could go totally venal on this. Maybe representatives should just do what's good for the representatives. We build in some institutional constraints so that what's good for them tends to also be what's good for us, but we don't expect anything more of them 
than uh, that they do uh, what is uh, what is good for them. Probably not where we want to go, but it should be noted. Maybe we solve this problem of doing what I would do and the weirdnesses that arise <coughs> by saying, look, representatives should do what they promised they would do. If they didn't promise anything, they're not particularly bound. But this should be something, we should see voting as something kind of like a contract, right? If I vote for Obama because he says he's going to close Guantanamo Bay, his job is to close Guantanamo Bay. It doesn't matter if he gets there and decides it's a bad idea, right? It doesn't matter if it's not what I would do if I, would knew, if I knew everything, right? Any more than um, if I go into a store and buy something and then, you know, it doesn't make me happy, it's the store's fault. No, the store's job is to sell me what I ask for. Barack Obama's job is to do what he promised on the campaign trail. Now, this has a lot of attraction, right? Because if you don't go this way, you could say, well, this limits people's ability to really participate in their political system, right? If Obama is not going to do what he says he's going to do, well, how, well, how do I know what's going to happen if I vote for him, right? Now I'm left as a citizen just kind of guessing about this. On the other hand, the problem with it is kind of obvious, right? It's very similar to the problem of maybe I want Barack Obama to do what I would do if I was Barack Obama, right? Maybe, maybe what he promised was not a good idea. Maybe what he promised is impossible or infeasible or would have bad consequences. And that's not clear until this, you know, he's in the situation himself. Um, okay. But if you think that promise, what they promise is, is important, then you might be more supportive of things like uh, bound mandates, where uh, politicians can be in trouble if they don't do what they promised. Or even things like uh, recall elections tend to support this kind of view, um, where politicians don't have a lot of freedom of action. All right. Maybe what they should do instead is vote their conscience. They should do what they think is the best thing to do, the best thing for everybody, best thing for the polity, right? Um, doesn't matter if uh, it's what they promised to do or what I would do. Um, and this is a kind of more virtue-based sort of picture. <coughs> uh, on this kind of picture, if I vote for Barack Obama, I'm not voting to close Guantanamo Bay, particularly. I'm not voting for someone who will do what I would do. Um, I'm probably not even voting for someone who, and not necessarily even voting for someone who's similar to me in relevant ways. What I'm doing is I'm vo basically voting for someone who I trust. I'm voting for someone who I think has a good conscience and will make good decisions even if I don't agree with them. This, of course, though, still raises some problems, right? This kind of picture could be that he does things that are wildly divergent from what I expected. And even if it's his conscience, right, even if it's genuinely what he thinks is best, um, this might undercut the democratic nature of democracy. Because I still am getting a little bit of a pig in a poke when I vote for any sort of representative, because they might change their mind once they're there. Um, it also re-raises some of these questions about who, you know, what is the relevantly moral thing, right, to look at? Who is everyone? If you're doing what's in everyone's interests, you're voting your conscience about what's going to be what's going to be best for everyone. Is everyone the nation? Is everyone the important people in the nation? You know, the people you actually care about. Are there people you, people, you know? Are there people that you get to not care about? Um, is everyone everyone in the world? Um, is doing what's best for everyone just following a kind of rule-based morality, or is it looking for consequences? And if it's tied to what everyone wants, right? To some extent, what's good for everyone is tied to their interests being satisfied. You know, um, what is in everyone's interest? <laughs> you know, what what doesn't everyone want? Uh, it can be very hard to really conceptualize whose interests uh, a representative is supposed to be looking out for. Okay. And one side note that's worth keeping in mind here um, about representation 
is a lot of these have implications for the question I mentioned referend, uh, recall referenda uh, a moment ago. A lot of these things have, have interesting implications for the question of whether transparency makes for better governance. Transparency, generally speaking, makes politicians more directly accountable to the people who they claim to represent. Because you know you can know on a more minute-to-minute -minute basis what's going on. But this can be a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it does give people a lot of control over the government. Um, and it, it fulfills one of the promises of democracy that people will be able to be in control of their own lives. On the other hand, transparency can be very dangerous for folks, for instance, voting their conscience. Um, you know, if Barack Obama really decided that closing Guantanamo Bay was not the best idea. Uh, his ability to govern effectively is not helped by the fact that every tiny little move on that is broadcast to people like me by Amnesty International so that I can send him nasty letters about it. Um, it may not even give it may not give him the space to do, do what he thinks is best because it makes it much easier for people to sort of come down hard on him and threaten him. You know, I'm not threatening Barack Obama in the sense of like, I'm going to do him bodily harm, but threaten him in the sense of having a lot of people say they're not going to vote for him. It may turn out, and this is an interesting thing, it may turn out that whether on the whole transparency is good or not depends to a large extent on how much civic virtue the rest of the population has. Uh, if I am willing to be respectful of other views and give public reasons and learn a lot about stuff and participate and talk with my fellow citizens, transparency may be less dangerous than if I'm just gonna, you know, go with sound bites and not really look into things too deeply and not be willing to listen to folks who might say, you know, hey, maybe this is maybe maybe the thing that you don't like is actually the better view. Um, so maybe that it's just self reinforcing. Uh, and it may be this. This may be a version of us getting the government we deserve, right? Uh, where civic virtue is low, government may only be functional if there's a lot of secrecy, and hence a lot of elite elite rule. Where civic virtue is high, it may be easier to have a government that's more open and more participatory. So maybe a, a vicious circle and a virtuous circle there. Who knows? All right, let's wrap this up. So Kant, Immanuel Kant famously argued that the problem of governance could be solved even for a race of devils. And his idea was that if you set your institutions up right, it doesn't matter how evil the citizens are or how evil the politicians are, you'll get good policy. This, alas, may not be true. Uh, given how devilish average human beings are, alas, may not be true. It may be that to have a good, sustainable, healthy, functional democracy, you need to have a certain degree of moral virtue among your citizens. But there's a couple policy barriers here. Saying that we ought to, as a political community, promote and endorse good citizenship may require a particular promoting a particular picture of the good. May require saying we think it's legitimate for everybody and for the government, perhaps to some degree, to say, no, look, the life where you volunteer for your church or you volunteer for your uh, activist group, uh, you get out, you make friends, you listen to people, you're tolerant, you move outside your comfort zone, um, and you go to the meetings and you and you vote and this sort of thing, that just may, may be the way to say, that just is the life that we are going to endorse. And a purely private life is one that we are going to not throw our weight behind. So it may require violating, to some extent, the liberal hope that government could run without making decisions about what the good life is. It's probably unavoidable. If the problem of governance cannot be solved for a race of devils, you need to figure out who the devils are and cast them out. Or, you know, turn them into not devilly things. Can you do that? Um, even perhaps more dangerously, citizenship, these virtues may need to be nurtured in the private sphere. This may require intervention into education of children or um, initiatives to promote participation in civil society, to promote 
possibly even initiatives to promote participation in the market or participation in religion in order to make sure that the virtues are, are inculcated. And representatives need to be good citizens too. But when you start scratching on that, it's not immediately clear what it means to be a good representative or a good leader. To some extent, the answer may be, go take the MFL classes. They'll tell you a lot more about being what being a good leader is. And hopefully they'll talk to you a little bit about the ethical considerations that you need. Um, or the answer might be that there's a deep connection between good leaders and good citizens. It may be that there's no such thing as being a good leader without there being good citizens to support you. And it might not be possible to be a good citizen without good leaders to lead you. Or that might be BS. I don't know. We'll talk about it later.